With the development of renormalization techniques in 1948 and 1949, physicists had added to their toolbox a powerful way to rescue quantum field theory from the infinities that had threatened to doom it. This approach allowed a way forward that did not require a fundamental reformulation of the quantum approach to understanding both the nature of matter and how matter interacted with other matter. In the case of quantum electrodynamics, the renormalized field theory approach, along with the Feynman diagram representation of the processes taking place, provided as powerful a description of any physical system as had ever been produced. The combination of fields and particles that gave rise to intermediate vector bosons to mediate the interactions between things created a compelling picture of how the universe was constituted on very small scales. So successful was the theory that it created a standard by which all other description would be, and still are to a degree, measured. However, within this perfection were the seeds of doubt. As other models failed to meet the requirements of convergence imposed by renormalization, questions began to arise as to whether field theory approaches were in fact the best way to describe nature, or if there was another, more forgiving, and even more powerful set of tools that would be able to describe those interactions within the nucleus that didn't satisfy the requirements of quantum field theory. These questions would take physicists on a long journey into a deep forest only to emerge from the thicket back in the clearing they had already found. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom. Episode 23, The Force is Strong in This One. In science, one of the fundamental truisms that must always be kept in the back of one's mind is the fact that as the process of inquiry is founded on the process of an observation, there is an inherent limitation in that while hypotheses and theories are built on what has been observed, there's always the possibility that not everything actually has been observed. While we will discuss the conundrum of observation on a more fundamental level in a later episode, limits of observation often have to do with the tools available to the scientist. Initially, these tools were restricted to the senses, but as technology is advanced, the realms of observation and experimentation can also be advanced. As an example, one of the suggested proofs of the Earth's motion around the Sun was that we should be able to observe the slight shift of the position of the stars from different places in the Earth's orbit at different times of the year. Attempts to measure this shift with the naked eye were first performed by Tycho Brahe in the late 1500s, but he was unsuccessful and thus concluded that the Earth could not be moving. However, it turns out to actually make such an observation, one needs technology that will amplify, in a sense, our eye's ability to see that shift. It wouldn't be until the technology of the telescope was not only developed, but also perfected to an appropriate point that Frederick Bessel would be able to make the first measurement of what is called stellar parallax in 1838, some 250 years after Brahe had first suggested that particular test of Copernicus's heliocentric model and made the first attempts to make those observations. When a new technology is developed or extended, it often opens up new observational possibilities, which then provide new data. This data then forces previously held hypotheses to be reconsidered and, if necessary, modified. The history of science is replete with examples of this impetus for progress. Such is the case in what we are now more and more referring to as particle physics. The initial steps towards doing quote-unquote big science had begun prior to World War II with the development of Rutherford's linear accelerator at Cambridge and Lawrence's cyclotron 
first at Berkeley and then at other places such as Columbia. However, as the war had spurred truly massive increases in funding from governmental agencies, the shift from tabletop nuclear and atomic physics to an analysis of cosmic ray tracks recorded in cloud chambers taken at high altitudes to a new world of particle accelerator physics created an ever-increasing stream of new data that would force a reconsideration of the picture that had held sway through the 1940s. As each step was taken, there was more data that revealed a world more complex than had originally been thought, and in doing so, forced the physicists to reconsider their models of nature. In 1927, at the third Solvay conference, the world was a pretty simple place in some respects when it came to things like particle physics. The dizzying array of elements had been simplified to the fairly well understood combinations of two elementary particles protons and electrons. The work of de Broglie and Compton just a few years earlier had added to those two the photon, and that was it. That's all there was. The belief was that the task that remained was to understand and create a theory that explained how these three types of particles would interact and then model the atom and our description of matter in the universe around that interaction. Once we did that, everything would be complete. A range from the lowest mass to the highest, you started with photons with zero rest mass, then there were electrons with a very small mass, and then protons with a mass of about 2,000 times that of the electron. But as we've been discussing for the last several episodes, a funny thing happened on the way to that theory. First, Dirac's work suggested a new kind of particle, something that would eventually be called antimatter. Then Pauli would suggest that the best way to describe the process of beta decay needed to involve another new kind of particle, something Fermi eventually dubbed the neutrino. In 1932, Chadwick would actually discover a whole new kind of particle, the neutron, that turned out to be part of what made up the nucleus of the atom, which was a pretty good thing because it really solved some difficult problems the old model of the nucleus had. In that same year, Carl David Anderson used an examination of cosmic rays, things that had more energy than any process on Earth could produce at the time, to discover Dirac's hypothesized new particle, something Anderson would dub the positron. In 1934, building off the work in quantum field theory done first for electromagnetism and then beta decay, Hideki Yukawa suggested a new interaction responsible for holding the nucleus together that he called the nuclear force and also put forward a new type of mediating particle for that interaction as was required by field theory, something he called the meson from the Greek word for intermediate. Called this because the mass of the particle would be between the very light mass electron and the heavier mass proton and neutron, it offered an opportunity to test the pre- renormalization field theory approach to understanding force interactions. In 1936, Seth Niedermeyer, working with Carl Anderson's Cosmic Ray Group, identified a particle in the cloud chamber data that could have been the particle predicted by Yukawa. Dubbed the mu meson, or muon, it turned out to have a mass similar to the electron, but a little bigger, and it was similarly charged. Over the course of the next decade, it would be definitively determined that this actually wasn't the particle that was the force carrier that Yukawa's nuclear force predicted. That particle, which would be called the pi meson or pion, would be discovered in 1947 by Cecil Power, Cesar Lattes, and Giuseppe Occolini, who were investigating cosmic ray products at the University of Bristol, based on photographic films exposed in the Andes Mountains. Powell's team recognized from the data that something was decaying into two muons, and through this indirect observation were able to recognize the presence of an as-of-yet undetected particle that would have the mass and properties predicted by Yukawa's model. That same year would also see the first detection of what were called K-mesons or kaons in the cosmic ray data. As the first high-energy particle accelerators came along in the early 1950s, there was a true explosion of data and new particles detected. These detections not only required the higher energies that only the new accelerators could create, 
but also a new generation of complex particle detectors that could reconstruct what was going on in the process of particle production. To explain how this worked, let me use an analogy first coined by Richard Feynman. Our process of understanding matter through the use of particle accelerators is a bit like taking a very finely crafted watch and throwing it at a wall at a very high speed and then filming what happens with a high speed camera. We look at the pieces that come out of that collision and we try to reconstruct how the watch was originally assembled. So how does this analogy relate to our topic here? What particle accelerators do, in essence, is to get some sort of particle up to as high a kinetic energy, as big a velocity as possible, and then collide it with a target of some sort. Sometimes that target is a stationary substance, as was the case way back with Rutherford's gold foil experiment, and sometimes it's another charged object moving in the opposite direction. That's the method the Large Hadron Collider at CERN uses. When the particle collides, there is a disruption of both it and the thing it collides with. Now, if either the particle or the target is made of smaller bits and pieces, they can come apart in that collision. What's more likely to happen, however, is that all of the energy of motion will be released by the collision and will, in accordance with Einstein's special theory of relativity, create new particles that fly off in certain directions depending on the type of disruption that actually happens. Sometimes these particles will be the sorts of things we're used to seeing, such as electrons or photons, but often, especially as the accelerator runs at higher and higher energies, the particles created are really exotic things not found occurring in nature except in these very high energy environments. So why is that? Well, the first reason is that they sometimes have really large masses, many, many times that of the proton or neutron. A particle that has that kind of mass, that much mass, takes a lot of energy to create. The second reason is that the particles created aren't very stable for the most part. They have very, very short lifetimes until they decay into other sorts of particles. This process was first hypothesized in some subatomic particles as happening with neutrons. It was thought that outside the stabilizing influence of a nearby proton, a neutron would change or decay into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. This was also thought to be the cause of beta decay within the nucleus of the atom when conditions were correct. This process was actually first observed in 1956, as I mentioned in the intro of the previous episode. The half-life of a neutron sitting in space all by itself is just a little bit over 10 minutes. In the decade between about 1955 and 1965, there was a whole, what I call and what history calls, a whole zoo of these sort of bizarre different particles that were discovered. Some of the particles seemed to fit into Yukawa's meson category, while others were definitely more massive, things that got called baryons. In either case, they had very short lifetimes. Most of the time, they decayed quickly into more stable, lighter mass particles. There were, however, a group of particles that seemed to have a strangely long lifespan when compared to similar types of particles that didn't. Now, as all of these particles accumulated and the zoo grew to contain more different kinds of what we called species, many of which were pretty exotic, there began to be attempts to try and bring some structure and order to all of it. Before I go into those efforts, I should make a few comments about quantum field theory at this point. Like I said, in 1948-1949, renormalized field theory was the theory to end all theories. Its success in explaining the interactions between charged particles and photons in quantum electrodynamics 
was so complete, it became the standard by which all other theoretical frameworks were evaluated. As part of this, it had imposed certain requirements on other interaction theories. Namely, the mathematics of a theory had to be renormalizable, and the correlation coefficients had to be such that the path integral formulation of the theory had to converge. In other words, all of the infinities had to get absorbed into the physical, measurable properties of the particles involved in the interaction, and when summing up the probabilities of all the different ways a process could happen in an interaction, the sum had to be finite. If an interaction theory, whether it be a field theory or not, did not meet these criteria, it was considered a failure. Unfortunately, all the interaction theories besides QED, in fact, failed these criteria. This included Yukawa's nuclear force, Fermi's beta decay causing interaction, and, if a field theory approach was attempted as an explanation, gravitation. Now this last one though is a little bit tricky since Einstein's general theory of relativity explains gravity in a very different way than a field theory would. And so it isn't exactly bound by the same rules as these sort of other kinds of interaction theories. Now before we move forward in the narrative I should say something about this failure of the Yukawa nuclear force. It should be understood that while the model of the interaction didn't meet the requirements of a renormalizable field theory, it was still widely used by the physics community because it was the best thing they had. In some ways, it's actually still used by a wide number of people in the physics community. Its description of an attractive force created by the interaction within the nucleus as being very short range, but very large, allowed nuclear physicists to develop quantum mechanical descriptions of the energy states for the protons and neutrons inside the nucleus. Just as the quantum mechanical description of the electron was eventually superseded by QED, but is still often used to do calculations that don't require the accuracy of the more complex description, Yukawa's nuclear force could still be used to describe the behavior of things inside the nucleus of the atom. What wasn't clear, though, was how the protons and neutrons interacted with each other and how the interaction force was actually created. For the next few years, there were many attempts to come up with new field theory approaches to these interactions, but by about 1955 or so, right in the middle of the decade, physicists were giving up hope that this would provide a satisfactory model of how the processes took place between the protons and neutrons in a nucleus, for example. We know that, somehow, the presence of a neutron creates an interaction that is stronger than the repulsive electromagnetic force between the protons and the nucleus. But the correlation coefficients that were calculated were all much greater than one, and thus the path integrals wouldn't converge the way they were supposed to. Because of this, physicists pretty much abandoned field theory as a fruitful path of investigation in the decade from the mid-1950s to the mid-1960s. During this time, there were a number of different alternative approaches tried with greater or lesser success, including Heisenberg's S-matrix formalism. While this seemed to provide some insight into the problem, especially in thinking about whether one could even identify certain types of subatomic particles as being more elementary than others, there wasn't a great deal of progress made. What was worse was that all of these alternative approaches were significantly worse in describing QED processes than renormalized field theory, thus creating a feeling that things were actually moving backwards. And this is where the accelerated data became so important. By the mid-1960s, the particle zoo, the list of all the different sorts of subatomic particles being created when the proverbial watches were being slammed together, was becoming pretty extensive. As this data began to pile up about the charges and the masses and the spins of all of these different exotic particles, along with what types of exotic particles decayed into other what types of exotic particles and which types of particles interacted with each other in some fashion, it began to become clear that there were really some strong regularities in the behaviors and that an organizing process or organizing principle might be helpful in making progress on the problem. Now, I should note here that I'm consciously calling back to the episode on the development of the periodic table in what I just said. 
just as that was pursued by a number of different individuals looking at different properties and criteria, so too did a number of physicists begin to collect particles together in groups using several different schemes. And just as the periodic table, when finally brought together, strongly hinted at some sort of underlying cause or structure, so too would some of these schema point to a deeper reality associated with all of these exotic and not so exotic specimens flying out of the collision sites into the detectors of the most powerful science machines ever created. The first attempt to produce a classification scheme actually started shortly after the discovery of the neutron and was done by, well, who else but Werner Heisenberg and Eugene Wigner in 1932. They noticed that the proton and the newly discovered neutron were so close in mass and seemed to behave identically in the nucleus that, you know, they developed this model that took this really unique idea. What they did is they said that they could treat the two particles as actually being the same particle but in different things that were called states. The way to kind of think of a particle that could be in two different states is to remember the electron and it having that quantity that we called spin. Now since the electron is a spin one-half particle, it turns out that it can either be in a plus one-half state, what we sometimes call spin up, and a minus one-half spin state what we call spin down. What Heisenberg did was assume that there was another quantum property of what he called the nucleon particle. For the nucleon, that property, very much analogously to what we think of as spin, also had a base value of one half. If the state of the nucleon was plus one half, then the nucleon was a proton. If it was minus one half, the nucleon was a neutron. Rather confusingly, Wigner called this new property isospin in a 1937 paper on the topic. At this point, the idea was mostly a mathematical convenience designed to better understand why two seemingly different particles behaved identically in Yukawa's model of the nuclear force. However, with the discovery of the pion in 1947, the idea that there was possibly another property of matter that could be used to define certain particle types gained new currency. It turns out that when we talk about the discovery of the pion, we're really talking about the discovery of three different particles with very similar masses and other properties, but that, like the proton and neutron, have different charges. This could be explained by saying that the three types of pions were actually one kind of particle that had an isospin of one, and thus three different states, positive one, zero, and negative one. As collider data emerged, other sets of particles were discovered that corresponded to multiple states of a single particle with other values of this isospin quantum number. In the early 1950s, physicist Murray Gell-Mann of the University of Illinois and Kazuhiko Nishijima of Osaka University began to recognize that certain particles, the, those aforementioned kaons or k-mesons, and other particles known as hyperons, produced first in cosmic ray collisions and then in particle accelerators, had surprisingly long lifetimes compared to the other particles that possess the similar properties. So that thing I talked about a little bit earlier. Independently of each other, they suggested that a way to explain this difference would be to say that there was yet a different quantized property that some particles might possess that would lead to this rather strange behavior. Gelman dubbed this new quantum number strangeness. And no, I'm not making this up. And yes, it does get worse going forward. From this, both men developed a relationship between the particle's electric charge and a combination of its strangeness quantum number, isospin quantum number, and what is known as the baryon number for the particle. That's a number that sort of talks a little bit about the type of particle something is. Things like protons and neutrons have a value of 1 for their baryon number, and mesons, like the pion, have a value of 0. The upshot of that relationship was that it showed that while these quantum numbers might represent different physical properties of a particle, they were not independent of each other, thus suggesting a deeper connection between all of these things.
Gelman, an Israeli physicist Yuval Niman, built on this picture by developing something that Gelman called the Eightfold Way in 1961. In this organizing principle, Gelman and Neyman each independently organized particles based on their charge and their strangeness. The name arose from the fact that there were two groups of mesons and one group of what were known as these baryons, things that had more mass like the proton and neutron, that could be organized into sets of eight. From this organization, it was clear that there was an obvious structure that related the electric charge and the strangeness quantum number. The baryon group was known to all have spin quantum numbers of one half, while one of the meson groups had a spin of zero and the other had a spin of one. I know it's all kind of confusing. The big thing to understand here is these guys who really come up with this cool structure that sort of grouped all of these different exotic species into certain classes, if you want to think about it. Gelman was then able to organize nine other baryons, all of which had a spin of three halves, into a structure that should have had ten members. However, like I say, it only had nine. From the insight that this structure provided, Gelman predicted in 1962 the existence of another particle that he called the omega baryon. He was able to predict the mass, the charge, and the strangeness of the particle based on his organizing principle. When the omega particle was discovered in 1964 by the group working at the Brookhaven Particle Accelerator, it was a huge confirmation of Gelman's principle equivalent in many ways to the discovery of Mendeleev's predicted echosilicon in the periodic table, that element we now call germanium. Both provided confirmation of the utility of the organizational principle through experimental verification of the predictions the principles made. As in the case of the periodic table, the Eightfold Way, along with the nishijima gelman relationship, showed that there was very likely an underlying cause that gave rise to the structure and regularity that was shown in this organizing principle. What remained to be seen was what that cause was. At about the same time as the Brookhaven group was discovering Gelman and Neyman's postulated omega particle, Gelman and a Caltech trained student of Richard Feynman's by the name of George Zwieg, who was working at CERN on his postdoctoral fellowship, both independently came up with an answer that would account for all of the structure in the Eightfold Way. What they said is that all of these different mesons and baryons were actually made up of even smaller particles that came in three different what we would call flavors. I told you it got worse. These three flavors were called up, down, and strange. These particles had spins of either plus or minus one half, electric charges of either plus two thirds or minus one third, and baryon numbers of one third. Each, of course, had an antiparticle where the three quantum numbers were opposite the regular matter particle. Finally, the up and down particles had a strangeness quantum number of zero, but the strange flavor particle had a strangest quantum number of one. From these smaller particles, you could build up the larger mesons and baryons. For example, a proton was said to be made up of two up particles and one down particle. This would give it a charge of two-thirds plus two-thirds plus minus one-third or plus one. A spin of plus one-half plus plus one-half plus minus one-half or one-half and a baryon number of one. Since the proton doesn't contain any strange flavor particles, it has no strangeness. The neutron would be made up of two down particles and one up particle, and thus would have a charge of zero, a spin of one half, and a baryon number one, and also no strangeness. Mesons, on the other hand, were said to be made up of a particle 
antiparticle pair, which would of course give them a baryon number of zero. While Feynman and Zwig would refer to these particles as partons, as they were thought to be made of a part of a larger object, it was Gelman who gave them the name that they are known by now, quarks. Taken from a line from a farcical poem in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, and here's the quote from that, quote, three quarks from Muster Mark, sure as he's got not much of a bark, and sure any he has it's all beside the mark. The three flavors match the line's numeration and the name's whimsicality caught the imagination of the physics community. The naming of the particle, however, would not be the only point of contention between Gelman and Feynman on this score. Gelman had introduced the idea as a mathematical framework in which to understand what was going on. He was actually really skeptical that these were real particles, that something like quarks actually existed. For him, the model was a convenient fiction that could be used to understand the data and make powerful predictions as to the behavior of the matter being studied. So Wiggs' formulation was based on the idea that quarks were actually real things that did exist in nature. He and Feynman argued that since the mesons existed independently of the baryons during the particle exchange process in the strong force, the quarks that made them up had to come from somewhere and thus must actually exist. Now this debate over whether the model description represented some real actuality or not depicts or is part of a much deeper philosophical controversy about the nature of scientific knowledge known as the realism versus instrumentalism debate. We'll return to this topic in a supplemental episode as it's at the heart of much of what we said in this series on the atom and nature of matter. With the proposal of this new type of particle, there was a renewed attempt to apply quantum field theory approaches to Yukawa's nuclear force. Now, instead of the interactions being between nucleons, one could say that they would be between the quarks that made up those nucleons. This would lead to a two-fold reinterpretation of the picture. One that operated between the baryons and mesons, which by the way, those two things together are called hadrons, and that classification includes all particles made of quarks. And another, which operated between hadrons that would look a lot like Yukawa's postulated force. The overall name given to this new interaction was called the strong interaction, as it was nearly 100 times stronger than the electromagnetic interaction. The intermediate vector boson that mediated this force was no longer a meson, but something that was called a gluon. And yeah, here we go again with the names. As in QED, quarks can exchange gluons to hold each other together. But since it turns out that the interaction is so strong, the gluons themselves are thought of as being sticky enough that they can interact with each other by exchanging other gluons. Due to the enormous amounts of energy stored in the strong field, quarks can be created out of that energy fairly easy, and thus mesons can be formed that create the exchange particle between the nucleons to hold them together. So this first set of quark-gluon interactions are given the name the strong force, while the second set of nucleon-nucleon interactions continue to be called the nuclear force or the nuclear strong force as a nod to the work of Yukawa. As powerful as this new description of particle physics was, however, it would be modified by the addition of yet another flavor of quark within a year. This would be called the charm quark. A few years after that, another quantum number would be applied to all flavors of quarks that would be called color. The motivation for these changes to the quark model would come from the other type of interaction that field theory had failed to describe well, that Fermi interaction that tried to explain why a neutron, sitting all by itself in space, transformed into that proton, electron, and antineutrino. At the same time, Gelman and others were putting together the description of the strong interaction. Sheldon Lee Glashow was beginning to unlock the secrets to understanding that interaction and seeing in a deeper and more unified picture the true nature of matter. In our next episode, 
We'll look at his work, along with that of Steven Weinberg and Abdus Salam, in developing the weak interaction and showing that not everything is as different as we once thought. As always, thanks for listening to the podcast. I'll put some of Gelman's diagrams for the Eightfold Way on our website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com, so you can take a look at his work. A warning, though, they're pretty arcane, and they might look a little more like something from one of those ancient tomes on alchemy than what you might expect from cutting-edge physics research. If you're enjoying this tour, drop us a note to say hi, and leave us a good review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever service you use to listen. We can always use a few good lab rats, and that's a great way to get the word out about the voyage. Also, if you'd like to keep up with the various science stories that catch our interest, stop by our Facebook page to see what's going on there. Until next time, full sails on your journey. <laughs>